once the equipment is set up, Peggy leaves it running for 24 hours. Later the same day, back at the research centre, Mike is testing a recently captured echidna. He works with Peggy, and they both think that they haven't seen this one for a couple of years. Its electronic tag confirms this. A unique 10-digit code marks this one out as Basil, a sub-adult male. Echidnas molt, and so Basil lost his old transmitter when he shed his old spines. To make space for a refit, some of the new spines are clipped off. They're only modified hairs, and so it's a bit like a haircut and doesn't hurt at all. The radio transmitter is coated in a long-lasting epoxy resin. It would normally go on a collar round the animal's neck, but echidnas have no neck to speak of, so the transmitter is glued directly onto his back. Bring back another one. <laughs> All wired up and transmitting, the latest member of the electronic age, Basil is taken back to where he was found. Echidnas can have a home range of up to 150 hectares, but it's still important that he's replaced in the exact spot he was picked up. It's scientific research like this that's revealed one remarkable echidna ability, which nearly all other mammals lack. They have a sixth sense, a receptor in their snouts sensitive enough to detect the electrical activity of underground grubs. Not bad for a creature whose ancestry stretches back for 120 million years. Take a short break, the travel agents advise, and it's a handy survival technique. Burying yourself alive is another. Here in Botswana, in southern Africa, the dry season is approaching. But there's still some water in the water holes, and African bullfrogs are taking advantage of it. Their only chance to mate. But it won't last for long. The land is heating up, the water holes shrinking, and if they don't find shelter soon, the bullfrogs will all die. There's nowhere to hide, so they bury themselves in the still soft mud. There, like all classic hibernators, they lower their metabolisms. For the next 10 months, they'll be Easterbaiting, which means that they're hibernating because of the heat and not the cold. Further north, in the vast Sud swamp of southern Sudan, there's another kind of suspended animation. The East African lungfish can live in shallow water with little oxygen. That's because it has primitive lungs and breathes air, rising to the surface about every 30 minutes. The Sud, over 100,000 square kilometers of impenetrable swamp, thick with papyrus and water hyacinth, also has a dry season. And each year, areas once underwater become exposed. Lungfish can survive in shallow water, but not in a mudslick like this. So it now bites into the ground and seeks survival through entombment. It makes regular visits to the top to breathe. But doubled up underground, these visits become less and less frequent. And finally, it just breathes through a hole in the top of its cocoon. But there is still water about, and the other fish, which once had the whole suit to swim in, are now concentrated into pools. And these attract the dinka. With so many fish in such a confined area, nets aren't necessary. A random spear throw will do. The dinka, also called the jieng, live around the swamps, unable to enter them for most of the year 
because the soot is almost impenetrable by foot or boat. It's only when it begins to dry up that these savanna cattle farmers set up swampside camps. For along with the almost effortless fishing, there's another easy source of food close at hand.